Hello, this is Professor Ben Kewitt of the Fullerton College Printing Technologies Department. Today, we're going to take a look at how to create a simple layout using Adobe InDesign intended for screen printing application for things such as t-shirts and maybe posters. Our project is intended for a one color output, and I'll explain a little more of that along the way. Specific in-depth tutorials already exist on a lot of the tools and processes that I'm using, so I may not go into serious depth on all of them beyond the scope of this project. Uh, be sure to check out the other videos in the class, and there are plenty of good tutorials I did not make all over the internet as well for more advanced applications. Okay, when you first open InDesign, you're going to have a blank page, basically. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hit Create New and get our new document startup pop up right here. In this menu, we're not going to do a whole lot for this because screen printing lives on a fairly simple diet of print requirements. For some other applications, if we're trying to produce something for a offset press or rotogravure or something where you would need to pay closer attention to a lot of this, but screen printing is fairly forgiving on its requirements, at least for the level of simplicity that we're going for today. So we're only gonna do one page because you can only print one side of one thing at a time using a screen. One screen is one sheet. We're gonna click off of facing pages. Not that it really matters with one sheet, but tis my habit. Page numbers don't matter. Page size is gonna be letter. Mine, I'm gonna to choose to do a landscape orientation, although either one is valid. You don't need to worry about columns, bleed or slug. Although margins, I will set to my favorite quarter inch. Remember that here in InDesign, margins are not any sort of constraint. They're not any sort of actual wall that stops you from designing, but they are like a little warning stripe painted on the ground that tells you not to walk over there because you're gonna fall off the edge of the cliff. So I put them about a quarter inch from the edge of my page as a reminder not to put anything important too close to the edge of my page. But beyond that visual reminder to me, they're not that important for this type of project. So we'll say, okay. There are some keyboard shortcuts I'll tell you a few of here. If you hold down the option key, if you're on a Mac, that would be Alt on a PC and scroll with your mouse wheel, you're able to scroll in and out and zoom in and out by scrolling the mouse wheel. Command zero or control zero gives you a full screen design. I'm gonna move this off of here. You have to forgive that my recording equipment does interfere a little bit with my actual uh, menus for InDesign. Okay, so we start out with a blank page. There's nothing scarier for an artist, right guys? Totally. Anyways, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna place an image on here. And I'm saying place, which is the correct name of what we're doing. Because in InDesign, you don't embed images. You don't put an image into your design, you place it onto your design. InDesign, ingeniously, although Cork Express does the same thing, does not put pictures into your design. It simply puts a placeholder and makes a note to itself that when you go to output or go to print, it will search your computer for that image through the path that you gave it and then pick it up and put it in. So if you wanna look at it this way, creating a project in InDesign is a little bit like planning a project and then the computer executes the project when you ask it to do it. You're creating a to-do list and a packing list of what fonts, what images, what text is the computer going to need to generate your output. And then when you hit print or hit export to PDF, then and only then is your design actually created. Anyways, let's start this to-do list for our computer right now. So placing an image, I do file place, it's gonna put a placeholder of the image into our design, but it's not going to create it permanently yet. Forgive me that I've already practiced this, but we'll make a second copy of this just to make sure that it's good here. So we're gonna to go to here, and I'm gonna choose this biplane clip art Stearman 5. I have a soft spot for biplanes. They are a lot of fun. So we're gonna go ahead and click open on this. And when you click on that, your mouse now has the icon of whatever image you're gonna place. If I simply click once, it will place the image at its original size and resolution that the file was saved at that may not necessarily be a high enough quality picture for printing. Uh, remember that if you're gonna print something normally, you are looking for 300 dots per inch or pixels per inch if you wanna speak it in computer language resolution and that'll print cleanly. Below that, it's not gonna be so great. So this is not fully up there to where it wants to be for, its, uh, for an actual proper output, but for demo purposes, it will do. It is black. I should also mention here that if you're creating for screen print, 
Screen printing can print with whatever color ink you put on that silk screen before you squeegee it through. But when you're creating the film positive that you're gonna use, some people call them vellums, to make your screen, you need to work in black and white. Black heavy ink coverage will block the exposure light of the table if you're using an exposure table or the sun if you're doing a gorilla in an alley somewhere, which does work by the way, and keep the light sensitive emulsion from hardening behind your image, which is gonna let it be an open part of your stencil later on. So remember when you're looking at this, black means yes ink, white means no ink. And that's how we're gonna work with this. So even if I print this with blue or yellow or red or you know silver glitter ink later on, black is gonna become that color when I put that color on the screen and push it through. Before then, black is simply telling me that this is where my image is going to be. So there we go, it's placed. Let me show you some other ways of doing this. Let's uh, place that again. So if I just clicked, it comes in as its known size. Let's open this again. If I click and drag, I can scale this image to whatever size I want it to be while I'm putting it in. And if I hold down Option, actually, never mind, that doesn't quite work. Ha ha. Shift is not something you want to press at this time. Shift lets you do it in weird stretches. So normally, when you're placing it, it'll constrain it to the direction you want it to go. Make it any size you want. Great. Now, if you click it with the black arrow, the normal select tool, you can move it around the page as long as you don't click the middle. If you click the middle of this thing, uh, let's go and do a quick explanation here again. You have this blue frame around the outside. It's kind of like the frame going around your picture, if it was a physical picture and a frame hanging on your wall. If you are selecting anything on the image with the black arrow other than the center, you're moving the whole thing, frame and picture. If you click on those little circles in the center, suddenly you can see this kind of goldish brown outline. As I move it around, I'm moving the picture inside the frame. And you can move the picture entirely away from it and not be able to see it at all. So be warned that can happen. Uh, undo is good. You can also do a, if this is a problem, you can right click and go down to fitting and go to center content, which is shift command E, which is something I do reflexively, but I wanted to show it to you more visually since me just saying shift command E and doing it on a video isn't as effective for people watching. So that will center it back to where it's supposed to be. You can also shrink the frame without shrinking the image and crop off parts. That is a possibility. So from here, let's add some more stuff to this. We have an image. We have a size that I more or less like. Let's add some text. On your left toolbar, you'll find a letter T. T is for type. It's also for tool. The type tool is going to let you create a text box or sorry, they call them frames now, a text frame. If you don't have a text frame, you can't type. In Illustrator, you can just click and start typing. In InDesign, if I click, nothing happens. I have to create an area that the type is going to inhabit. Kind of how the picture went there. And I don't know why this is right aligned default. That's a weird default. Make that left aligned there. So down here, I could put something in and maybe throw on the name of the plane because I do like these things. This is an N2S Steerman. There we go, name of the plane, because why not? So now I have my text in the box and now we can do a few things to change it around. Up at the top of your screen, there's another adaptive toolbar across the top of InDesign. And up here, when text is selected, you have text controls. This is where I can get lost and hopefully you will too for hours, not too long, I hope. But once you click on here, you can choose what typeface you want to use. The top is gonna show you ones you've recently used and down below is going to show you everything you have installed and currently active on your computer. And you can see the words you wrote in this little preview section and what they're going to look like in these different typefaces. Uh, some are better than others. Some are so completely, um, what's the word, novelty that it won't even make any sense visually when you're looking at it. For today, I'm going to choose one that's fairly basic here. I'll choose stencil because sure that looks good for all airplanes, right? Unless, do I have, time out. There you go, Amarillo USAF. This is the one I'm gonna use for today. It's one of my favorites for airplane things because it's basically the typeface that I use to stencil on planes themselves. Anyways, back to full screen here. From here, I can center the text using the button up at the top. You see these are the paragraph controls. I can align the text to the middle 
and you can make it bigger or smaller over here with the small t and the big t, this is gonna be your type size changer. You can choose a point size or you can do it differently. For now, let's choose 72. By the way, point, quick aside on points, so this will be covered separately elsewhere. A point is not a computer measurement based off of pixels, as uh, many people think coming into this. A point is an actual measurement in the real world based off of being 1 72nd of an inch. By using a number like 72, it allows it to be divisible by a lot of different things and lets you do thirds very easily on a sheet of paper, where an inches only works in kind of halves, quarters, eighths, and are very much a base two system here, uh, there. Uh, but uh, by doing a number 72, you can divide by threes and fours equally well, and that lets you go into multiple different types of layout. Anyways, that's an aside. I'm sorry. Tangent man strikes again. So now I have too much text for my box. This is a good problem because it lets me show you what to do. First off, you might see a little red square with a red plus in the bottom. The plus does not mean better. The plus means overset text or there's too much text and not enough box. There are two ways to fix this. One is to double click on the edge of the frame where it goes off the edge, and that will extend the frame until it fits. The other, let me undo, is to make the text smaller until it fits. If you click enough times to select everything or Command A, and you can either go down and guess until it all fits, or one of my other favorite key keyboard shortcuts is Command Shift greater than or less than, unless you're on a uh, PC, then it's Control Shift greater than or less than, and greater than makes the text bigger. Less than makes the text smaller. Every time you tap it, it goes smaller, smaller, smaller till it fits. And it's still about 50 points, which makes it about, mm, I'm just winging this one, by the way, uh, three quarters of an inch or so tall on text. And that's actually a little smaller than you probably want on a t-shirt. So we can also make it bigger again. If you hold down command while you stretch a text box, it will make the text inside larger too. If you hold down shift at the same time, it will keep your proportions while you do that. So you can also increase and decrease your text by messing with the box and holding down command and shift, which stretches the inside as well. The same thing works with images, by the way. Okay, I'm gonna add one more thing that's kind of a fun bit to finish this design out for you here. And let's go ahead and do that. That is type on a path. So if you click and hold down on the type tool, you'll notice there's type on a path below. But in order to put type on a path, you kind of need a path. So let's build that first. I'm going to go down my column here to the ellipse tool, and I'm going to create an ellipse frame. Now, one of the things I like to do, if you draw a circle or an ellipse, you're drawing from an imaginary corner of a square, the corner of an imaginary square drawn around your circle, which is kind of hard to measure where you're going. If you hold down option, let me start that over. You can see it's coming from the center. I find that much easier. So I'm gonna start in the middle of my plane, hold down option and make a, a circle to have an arched bit of text over the top. We'll do it right here. Bingo, cool. Now from here, I'm going to select the type on a path tool here, click on the path and type in Boeing, which is not a company I have copyrights to, but this is a print of a historic aircraft. So now I have it up there. I can give it the same typeface. Another thing you can do, by the way, if you want to steal the same typeface from somewhere else, if you select your text and grab the eyedropper tool from the toolbar over here, you can then click on the other text you've already done and it will pick up the same font style, size, um, everything that you've been using. Now, this is not the most useful. You can see it kind of dropped in a weird place. So let me show you how to center that better. It already is set to center, but what is it centering to? Wherever you clicked is where it starts and stops to make the thing. Um, rather than just starting in the right place, I thought it was better to show you the change. Up here, you can see there are two lines with a box on the edge. And if I hover my cursor over it, I get a little line with an arrow. This lets me move this. This is the beginning and the end of where the text would go to if it went all the way around the circle. So I'm going to take the end and bring it all the way around my ellipse to the back side of the plane here on the equator. Then I'm going to take the top of the start line and drag it all the way down to the equator of my ellipse. And now the word on top is centered over the thing. I'm just about out of time for a 15 minute video here. So we're going to stop here and we'll come back for a few more bits of fussing in a second video, as well as how to output to PDF. 
Thanks for watching. I hope this is helpful.